Hello everyone. In this lecture, I'll be covering the SRBP signaling pathway that mediates uh, lipogenesis and the transcription of lipid synthesizing enzymes. Towards the end of this lecture, I'll bring you up to date on some research, specifically this title or this article titled uh, Post-Transcriptional Regulation of De Novo Lipogenesis by mTORC S6K1 uh, SRPK2 signaling by Lee et al. titled, the, um, published this year in the journal Cell. So I hope you enjoy. Okay, so what is SRBP and why should we care? This is what we're gonna talk about in this slide. Well, SRBP stands for sterile regulatory element binding protein. These proteins are a class of transcription factors that bind to these SRE elements in DNA. SRE being sterile regulatory element. And these SREs are found at the promoters of genes involved in lipid synthesis and cholesterol, uh, cholesterol synthesis. Uh, an example being uh, HMG-CoA, which is the limiting factor in cholesterol metabolism. So if a cell is synthesizing lipids or cholesterol, they undoubtedly have SRBP proteins promoting gene expression. Humans have two SRBP genes, SRBP1 and SRBP2. SRBP1 can be spliced in two forms, SRBP1A and SRBP1C. So we're basically talking about three different uh, forms of SRBP. Uh, between these two isoforms, SRBP uh, primarily is regulating lipogenesis, while SRBP2 is primarily regulating cholesterol metabolism. So there is some overlap, meaning uh, SR1 BP1 or SRE BP1 can partially make up for cholesterol synthesis if SRBP2 was knocked out, and it goes the other way as well. So there is overlap in terms of where they bind. The loss of both SR uh, of both isoforms results in roughly 90% less lipid and cholesterol synthesis. So that kind of gives you an idea of how important SRBP proteins are in the um, transcription of lipid synthesizing and cholesterol synthesizing enzymes. Neuronal cholesterol in lipid synthesis occurs in astrocytes and cannot be derived from the bloodstream due to the presence of the blood-brain barrier. So you might notice from my lectures that I'm very uh, neuroscience oriented. And in the context of SRBP, we can say not only are SRBP proteins highly expressed in the brain, but they are specifically expressed in astrocytes. Um, it's additionally important for these astrocytes to keep SRBP active because dietary lipids and cholesterol don't get into the brain thanks to the blood-brain barrier. So they must be synthesized on the spot in the brain, uh, primarily using glucose as a, a source of carbon in the synthesis of lipids. Uh, deletion of SCAP, uh, SCAP, SCAP, it's a protein required for SRBP activation. Uh, deletion of this, this SCAP protein causes microcephaly and motor neuron dysfunction. So complete deletion of SRBP uh, causes embryonic lethality, lethality, and I don't think uh, I don't think any conditional brain deletions have been done yet, but that would be a great idea. But the idea here is that. Uh, SCAP, a protein required for SRBP activation, uh, when it's deleted, the brain does not develop correctly and there's uh, widespread motor dysfunction. And another reason to be interested in SRBP is astrocytes and Huntington's disease have roughly 50% less uh, nuclear or uh, processed SRBP than controls. So this, and, and this may actually contribute to the cholesterol defects that are observed in Huntington's disease. So this is not necessarily a smoking gun. It doesn't mean SRBP deficiency causes the disease, but it is an interesting correlation. And it's another reason to be interested in SRBP and why this lecture uh, is important to, to look through. So let's get into specific pathways. Okay, so to begin with this pathway, we're gonna actually be starting in the endoplasmic retic reticulum, the ER. So this is our ER membrane. 
And SRBP proteins are actually embedded into the ER. So this will be SRBP, uh, any isoform, SRBP1 or 2, are both embedded into, found embedded into the ER. And they are bound to, let's use a different color, they are bound to another protein called SCAP. SCAP for uh, SRBP cleavage activating protein. And SCAP has a sterile uh, binding domain. Let's say this is the sterile binding domain. And it can actually bind to sterols like cholesterol. So this is, this is going to be our little cholesterol coming in. So cholesterol can bind to SCAP. And when cholesterol binds SCAP, SCAP can then, uh, it produces a binding domain that can bind this other protein called N, N sig one or two actually. There's two isoforms, N sig one or two, doesn't necessarily matter. And when N sig one or two binds to SCAP, it blocks uh, copy coat, copy, uh, copy coat formation. So in other words, it's blocking the, um, the movement of this SRBP SCAP complex to the Golgi. In SIG1 binds to uh, cholesterol bound SCAP. And the region that it binds to is the uh, targeting motif to the Golgi. So what happens if cholesterol level drops? If cholesterol level drops, we don't have cholesterol, we can erase cholesterol. If there's no cholesterol, it's not bound to SCAP, which means NSIG isn't going to be inhibiting copy coat formation. So our copy, see, copy coat, our copy coat can form, and this facilitates the uh, transport to the Golgi. So let's draw our Golgi over here. That's going to be our Golgi. And so our SCAP SRBP arrives in the Golgi. But really what's important here is going to be SRBP going to the Golgi apparatus. So if SRBP travels to the Golgi, it's actually recognized by two uh, Golgi resident uh, proteases called S1P and S2P. These two proteins are proteases that recognize a very particular site on SRBP and they cleave it. So when Golgi or when uh, SRBP translocates to the Golgi, it's cleaved by S1P and S2P at different sites. And this actually releases SRBP uh, from the Golgi. We actually get uh, C SRBP for cleaved SRBP. I'm not even trying to draw how it's cleaved, but it does get cleaved. And once it's been freed from a membrane, where does it go? And we see this pattern all the time. Uh, it goes to the nucleus. And so SRBP translocates to the nucleus where it binds to our uh, SRE elements on DNA. So it'll be an SRE element. And when it does this, it activates transcription. Um, among the most important transcription uh, products would be HMG-CoA and uh, I don't know, fatty acid synthesis or synthase, some other ones. Um, but this is the general pathway. The critical event is the translocation of SRBP to the Golgi. And that's where the cholesterol synthesis uh, sensing happens right here. If cholesterol binds to this location right here, then NSIG comes in. When NSIG comes in, it it, uh, it keeps the SCAP SRBP complex uh, locked in the ER and prevents it from getting cleaved. Okay, so in this pathway, uh, in this slide, we're gonna be talking about some of the regulation of the SRBP pathway. So let's begin with the sterol, it's like cholesterol. What does cholesterol do? It inhibits the uh, 
SRE BP uh, Gold G translocation, right? It binds to SCAP, and when SCAP is bound to cholesterol, it allows NSIG1 to uh, bind, right? Sterol also activates another protein that we haven't talked about is S uh, TRC8. TRC8 is a ubiquitin ligase, a resonant ubiquitin ligase of the ER, which is where all this is occurring in the ER. And so as, uh, TRC8 is going to be actually degrading SRBP. So th these are probably the two main mechanisms by which SRBP Golgi translocation is prevented, is the uh, continuous degradation of SRBP by uh, TRC8, which is often found in complex with SCAP and SRBP, and the just the presence of sterols. The presence of sterols like cholesterol uh, prevents translocation. If it gets past both, both of those steps and it does translocate, it gets to the Golgi where it meets uh, S1P and S2P, uh, and they, they, they cleave. Right, and so that cleavage event uh, dispatches uh, S, uh, SRBP. Well, let's see, cleaved SREBP, and SRBP at this point actually links up with another protein. The cleavage produces a binding site for uh, important beta. Important beta is. Uh, as the name kind of says it, it implies, it imports, it imports SREBP into the nucleus. So this goes into the nucleus, which I'll say is right through here. Let's see, what else do we have? We have, um, we have, during starvation, we have the activation of two really important proteins called AMPK and SIRT1. Uh, so AMPK is AMP uh, activated or protein kinase, AMP kinase, and it's activated by AMP. If it's activated by AMP, that means it's activated during starvation, right? And SIRT1 is a NAD uh, dependent deacetylase. So SIRT1 is activated by NAD. When is NAD high? during starvation. So both of these um, proteins are essentially turned on during starvation. And what do they do? They inhibit, let's stop using blue. They inhibit the translocation of um, SREBP. And why does that make sense? Well, if SRBP is in the nucleus promoting gene transcription, then it's gonna be promoting the uh, uh, anabolic uh, construction of lipids. You know, you don't want to be building lipids when you're starving. That doesn't make any sense. You want to be burning lipids when you're starving. So in this way, uh, starvation inhibits SRBP primarily through AMPK and SIRT1. Although the exact mechanism I did not find, but they are known to inhibit. Uh, a mechanism by which SRBP is promoted is insulin and uh, growth factor signaling. So something like BDNF or um, you know just insulin, any kind of growth factor activates, uh, they tend to converge on this protein called AKT. AKT activates mTORC primarily among many other things, but one of the big ones is mTORC. And how does mTORC play a role in this? Well, mTORC can actually phosphorylate SRBP. mTORC also activates this other downstream protein called S6K1. This will be important for the lecture as it pertains to the, the uh, paper that we're going to be dis uh, discussing. But AKT, which is downstream of insulin signaling, uh, activates mTORC. mTORC um, promotes the translocation of SRBP into the nucleus. And for a long time, people didn't really understand how. Um, I still don't think we necessarily know exactly how that works, but we know there was a recent paper where AKT inhibits a protein called lipin, L-I-P-I-N, lipin. 
in lipin was shown to inhibit uh, SRBP in the nucleus. So mTOR hyperphosphorylates this protein called lipin, and the hyperphosphorylation of lipin uh, prevents lipin from going into the nucleus and inhibiting SRBP. So the pathway can get a little bit murky and not a whole lot is understood about how SRBP, is, what promotes its movement into the nucleus and what doesn't. But generally, uh, markers of starvation like AMPK and CERT1 inhibit SRBP translocation, and that makes sense. Uh, growth factors like mTORC or AKT signaling generally promote the SRBP translocation of the nucleus. And that makes sense because if you have plenty of nutrients, if you have insulin signaling, you have glucose, if you have growth factors, you're, you're being told to uh, proliferate. So you're going to activate uh, catabolic programs to start building nutrients or to build fatty acids and whatnot, perhaps with the, the glucose that you just pulled in. You can use that as a source of carbon to build uh, fatty acids. And so it makes sense that these uh, mTOR promotes SRBP and AMPK CERT1 inhibit SRBP translocation. Okay, so let's transition into this paper titled Post-Translational Regulation of De Novo Lipogenesis by mTORC S6K and SRPK2 by Lee et al. So rapamycin, rapamycin is a potent inhibitor of mTORC is capable of preventing SREBP mediated lipogenic protein transcription in response to glucose. So SRBP can be dispatched to the nucleus in response to a lot of different cues, such as you know, cholesterol depletion principally, as we just discussed. But specifically in response to insulin and glucose signaling, mTORC appears to be critical for the uh, lipogenic gene expression through uh, SRBP. So again, rapamycin, which inhibits mTORC, prevents SRBP from uh, working in response to glucose. Uh, again, the specific mechanism by which mTORC activates SRBP and downstream lipid synthesis is not very well understood. It might have something to do with lipin, as we discussed in the last slide, it is in some way required for, or it needs to be inhibited by mTORC in order to uh, open up the expression of SRBP um, genes, but the idea hasn't been uh, pursued since it was um, discovered in, I think it was 20, a paper around 2010. In an unbiased screen of mTORC phosphorylation targets, Lee et al., this current paper, discover a post-transcriptional mechanism of lipogenic regulation. So what was nice about this paper is that they, they, did, they didn't anticipate any of these findings. They essentially they screened for phosphorylation targets of mTORC. Then after identifying an interesting one, they then discovered that it was important for lipogenesis. So they essentially stumbled on these findings. So let's talk about what they were. So SRPK2 is phosphorylated by mTORC and it's shuttled into the nucleus. So SRPK2 stands for SR protein kinase 2 and SR proteins, which is an S and an R, um, they are proteins that bind to pre-mRNA and they regulate splicing. So S uh, stands for serine and R stands for arginine. So it binds to these uh, serine, it uses a serine arginine rich um, domain to bind to mRNA and it does, it does so in such a way to regulate the splicing of certain transcripts. So at this point, the authors had no idea what the importance of SP um, or SRPK2 phosphorylation and its nuclear translocation was. So they knocked down SPR or SRPK2. When they knocked it down, they, they saw that it reduced the expression of lipid synthesizing enzymes by roughly 50%. And they found out that this was due to uh, mRNA being destabilized. So the, um, well, so these results suggest that SRPK2 is a downstream regulator of mTORC. Um, 
and it, and it mediates lipogenesis. So it's not an or overly complex pathway. Basically, mTOR phosphorylates cytoplasmic SRPK2, and this causes its uh, nuclear translocation, where it functions to stabilize mRNA involved in lipid metabolism. And the mRNA involved in lipid metabolism is, of course, derived from SREBP-mediated transcription. So this is a, a, a mechanism by which mTOR promotes the expression of SREBP genes. Okay, so let's see if I can depict an outline of what this paper was describing. So we have nutrients, nutrients. We also have, just in general, this is say anabolic conditions. You know, you, the, the cell wants to build stuff, okay? So we have nutrients, we have the anabolic conditions to do that. What's that do? That means uh, mTORC is on. It activates mTORC in general. We can say that it activates mTORC. mTORC is activated during anabolic conditions. Uh, mTORC is always accompanied with its uh, downstream partner. Its downstream partner is S6K. Why is it working? Uh, S6K1. It's a uh, S6 kinase 1. It's, it's just a protein that's usually activated with mTORC. And these two proteins, uh, S6K and mTORC, they work together to phosphorylate SRPK2, or SR protein kinase. And when they place their little uh, phosphate group right here, it recruits a another protein called SK1. And this was completely unexpected. This was discovered through a, a uh, phosphorylation site screening. But they found that when mTORC or S6K phosphorylated SRPK2, that it, it recruited SK1, uh, casine kinase 1, it's just a constitutively active kinase. Don't know where it came from, but it's there. And it also phosphorylates uh, SRPK2. And this, these two phosphorylations appear to be critical for the translocation uh, into the nucleus. So this will be our nucleus. So SK1 phosphorylation or uh, mTORC slash S6K phosphorylation of SRPK2 induces its nuclear translocation. And let's not forget that mTORC also promotes SRBP uh, translocation into the nucleus. And this is kind of um, kind of happening in the background. This paper didn't uh, focus too much on SRBP. It's more focused on mTORC and um, SR proteins, but uh, SRBP is moving into the nucleus. Uh, another thing not to forget is that this entire pathway, everything downstream of mTORC is inhibited by rapamycin. So this indicates that rapamycin, uh, that uh, mTORC is really critical for everything that is happening in this pathway, because if you put in the mTORC inhibitor rapamycin, everything stops in its tracks. So you don't see SRBP translocation, you don't see lipid uh, synthesis, you don't see any of, the, uh, any, any of these downstream effects. Okay, so let's move to DNA. What's happening to our DNA? So SREBP is binding to the SRE elements. SRBP, SREBP, and it's activating transcription, right? So how does it do that? Well, it recruits our um, RNA polymerase 2. RNA... Uh, Move it up here a little bit. RNA polymerase 2. RNA polymerase 2 is the primary polymerase that um, produces mRNA. And so as it's going through our transcript, it's going to be making the, um, the pre-RNA, right? It just looks like here it's coming out of uh, one of the holes in RNA polymerase. And this is where our SR proteins come in. We have an SR protein 
that actually binds to the exons of the, the transcript. And this is called um, exon splicing enhancing. It binds to the exons. Certain SR proteins can also bind to the introns and um, promote intron splicing. Others can bind to exons and promote the splicing of an exon. Um, they do a lot of weird things that I didn't look through. But you have these SR proteins and they have a certain domain called in uh, RS, an RS domain. See, this is an RS domain. And that's actually the domain that gets uh, phosphorylated by this SRPK2. So SPRK2 translocates into the nucleus right here where it phosphorylates SR proteins. And this phosphorylation was shown to be absolutely critical for the proper splicing of lipogenic genes. So the inability to get SPRK or SRPK2 into the nucleus uh, caused these transcripts, these pre-mRNA transcripts downstream of SRBP to be degraded. They were not able to be spliced correctly. They didn't function. So ultimately we can say that phosphorylation of these certain SR proteins, the targets of SRPK2 is critical for the proper expression of SRBP um, regulated genes. And it all goes back to mTORC, uh, S6K, and CK, CK1. CK1 is constitutively active, so it doesn't play as big of a role, but mTORC is specifically activated by nutrients and anabolic conditions. So ultimately, this, this uh, mTORC pathway is very important for the phosphorylation of SR proteins and the stabilization of mRNA transcripts. So the authors were curious how uh, SRPK2 was actually affecting the expression of all these different genes. And SRPK2 being a kinase could potentially be phosphorylating transcription factors. It could be binding to a transcription factor. It could be uh, phosphorylating a protein, who knows? So they were looking at all these different parameters and they only found significance in the stability of mRNA. So when they were looking at the stability of mRNA, they wanted to look at how long the mRNA was around for. So what they did was that they would inhibit transcription. Actinomycin D is an inhibitor of transcription. It inhibits RNA polymerase II. And then they looked at the stability of all these different uh, lipid synthesizing enzymes. All these enzymes are really critical for lipid synthesis. And they wanted to see what's happening to the mRNA when we, uh, under all these different conditions. So they, they, they found that after, if you, the black bars are short hairpin GFP, so it's a control condition. So we see in all these different control conditions, the black bars are kind of just pretty stagnant. The, amount, the mRNA isn't going up, it's not going down. It's, it, the mRNA is stable in these conditions. Even four hours after uh, stopping transcription, the mRNA is pretty much stable in, the, in those conditions, right? However, when you inhibit rapamycin, or when you inhibit mTORC with rapamycin, you see a huge decrease in the stability of these mRNA transcripts. They're they're roughly you know fifty percent uh, have been have been uh, destroyed by four hours after inhibiting transcription. So mTORC is in some way important for the stability of these uh, lipo lipogenesis promoting enzymes, which is interesting. Well, let's see what uh, short hairpin RNA towards SRPK2 does. When they inhibited SRPK2, they saw a similar trend. They saw that the mRNA of all these lipid synthesizing enzymes was also not stable. And they, since uh, SRPK2 phosphorylates SR proteins, which they did show in this paper, I don't have a graphic for it, they are saying that, well, that's probably the mechanism by which mRNA is being stabilized because mTORC is phosphorylating S SRPK2, causing nuclear translocation, where it stabilizes mRNA transcripts like these ones. 
And here is actual proof that the mRNA is less stable when uh, either mTORC or SRPK2 is inhibited. On the right, you see um, graphics that show very clearly that the amount of lipids being produced is vastly downregulated when you knock down either SRPK2 or rapamycin. So in, in these cases, when you knock down SRPK2, so the only thing they're doing here is they're knocking down SRPK2. Some you know, kinase that phosphorylates SR proteins. Is it important? Well, when you knock it down, you see roughly 50% decline in the amount of fatty acids being produced. Same thing with rapamycin. Someone might ask, is rapamycin important? Or I keep saying rapamycin. Someone might ask, is uh, mTORC important for lipid synthesis? You could show them these graphs and say, well, when you inhibit mTORC with either taurin or uh, rapamycin, you see almost you know 70%, 80% decline in the amount of acetate being um, labeled acetate being incorporated into fatty acids and cholesterol. So yes, mTORC is very important for the uh, synthesis of, of um, lipids. So I hope you guys enjoyed this paper. If you have any questions or you need to see other figures, just ask me and thanks for watching. Okay, so here are two important figures from this paper. Uh, let's start with uh, the figure on the right, E. So they're using these cells, they're using TSC2 minus cells. And all you need to know about TSC2 minus cells means that mTORC is constitutively active in these cells. So uh, mTORC is constitutively active and they're looking at two different conditions, the cytoplasmic uh, fraction and the nuclear fraction. And I always tack I always tackle Westerplatz uh, lane by lane. So let's begin with DMSO. DMSO is just basic um, nutrient deprived uh, medium. And in if there's if we're using TSC2 minus cells, then mTORC is constitutively active in all of these lanes. So we see baseline amount of SRPK2 expression. That's the basic amount that we see. We see uh, relatively high amount of SRPK2, not too much. We see uh, phosphorylated S6K1, which is just the downstream partner of, um, of, of mTORC. So this is basically a proxy for how active mTORC is. That basically tells you how, how active it is. And down here, we just see no lamin A, so we don't have any nucleus in our fraction we see gap DH, which means we have uh, the cytoplasmic fraction. That just tells you where that you have the correct uh, area of the cell. And so in the second condition, we see cytopl the cytoplasm when rapamycin is administered. Rapamycin inhibits mTORC. And curiously, we see more SRPK2 in the cytoplasm when mTORC is inhibited which makes sense, right? Because mTORC phosphorylates SRPK2 and they're claiming that that causes nuclear translocation. We see much less phosphorylated SRPK2, which again makes sense. SRPK2 uh, is not, if mTORC is inhibited, then SRPK2 will not be phosphorylated. We also see no or hardly no uh, phosphorylated S6K, indicating mTORC is indeed uh, turned off. Okay, so that's what's happening in the cytoplasm. Let's see what's happening in the nucleus. When rapamycin is constitutively active, we see a ton of SRPK2 in the nucleus. We see lots of phosphorylated SRPK2 in the nucleus, especially compared to the cytoplasm. So you compare these two conditions, you can kind of uh, see that the uh, amount of the phosphorylated SRPK2 fraction is found in the nucleus. Uh, the other lanes don't matter too much. So what what else? Uh, what's happening when when mTORC is inhibited? Well, when mTORC is inhibited, we see less SRPK2 in the nucleus. We see almost no phosphorylated SRPK2. And this means that 
the uh, inhibition of mTORC is preventing SRPK2 from getting into the nucleus. And if it does get into the nucleus, it's not phosphorylated. And so this figure on the left, I should mention that there will be some gaps in the logic. So I'm only giving you a couple of figures that I found most compelling. Uh, we're, we're simply looking at gene expression compared to the control condition. So it's all standardized to one. And so they're looking at all these different um, fatty acid th synthesizing proteins and looking at the expression of all these proteins. And when you inhibit rapamycin, or sorry, when you inhibit mTORC, you see you know, roughly 50% decline in the amount of uh, the, the expression of all these different important enzymes for lipid synthesis. And when you inhibit SRPK2, you might be wondering, why is SRPK2 so important? Well, if you knock it down using siRNA, short, or short hairpin RNA, you see uh, huge decreases. You know, it's roughly 50% of the expression of all these really important uh, lipid synthesizing enzymes. So gene expression, or sorry, the uh, knockdown of SRPK2 is, is not, also knocks down the expression of lipid synthesizing enzymes.